Hi, everyone, and welcome to the One Valley Generative and Applied AI Pitch Event. We had an overwhelming number of applications this round, and so we're especially excited to hear from our eight competing finalists. I'm Tara Coleman, Director of Strategic Initiatives at One Valley, and I'll be your host for today. I would also like to apologize in advance. Today is my first day of spring allergies, but I'll try my best not to sneeze through today's whole event. Um, I also want to say that none of this would be possible without our event partner, Brex. On behalf of the whole One Valley team, I'd like to thank them for making this event a reality, and we'll hear more about them later on. Before we kick it off, I want to tell you a little bit about what we do here at One Valley. One Valley is a global entrepreneurship platform that supports entrepreneurs, accelerates startups, and empowers organizations across the globe that foster innovation communities. Our mission at One Valley is simple democratize the resources of Silicon Valley and share them with the global community. We do so through a variety of initiatives, including events like this. And through Passport, our online innovation platform. We have over 40,000 members from around the world who access and interact with not only each other, but also dozens of corporate partners, hundreds of mentors and investors, and nearly $1 million in discounted and free technology tools and services. Special for our viewers today, we're offering 30% off a premium Passport membership, the code PASSPORT30. So if you're not a member yet, I encourage you to check us out, take advantage of the discount by clicking the banner at the bottom of your screen. As I mentioned, this event has been supported by our partner at Brex. We can't thank them enough for helping us cultivate this community around innovation and supporting us in showing some of the exciting AI, entrepreneur, AI entrepreneurs that exist in our ecosystem. Thanks to Brex, Every presenting company you see today will be walking away with at least $250 preloaded on a Brex card. Our three runner-ups will receive $500 each, while our winner will receive $750 from Brex in addition to the $2,500 cash prize and one-on-one -on -one meeting with our judges. Before we get into the pitches, let's jump into our fireside chat. I'd like to introduce Ryan Welsh. Ryan is the founder and CEO of Kindy, a company backed by Intel Capital and Pivot North and recognized by the World Economic Forum as a technology pioneer. We'll get into that a little bit later. Before founding Kindy, Ryan led the spin out and commercialization of technologies developed at Los Alamos, specifically in quantum cryptograph, cyber technologies, low orbit satellites and machine learning, all very impressive. We're incredibly lucky to have Ryan with us today, sharing his experience in enterprise, his journey as an AI founder, and his thoughts on the future of generative AI. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and give Ryan a chance to introduce himself um, and Kindy. Yeah, hi, hi Tar. Tar, good, good to be, to be here. here. A bit, a bit of an I think, I think, we're, I think we're good now. Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, so so Tar, you, you provided a, a Good, good background on me. So typically, I start these things by saying I'm the founder and CEO of Kindy, and I did all this cool stuff. But you already you already said that. Um, so uh, uh, at Kindy, we're an enterprise answer engine. We uh, like to focus on providing answers to users in, in the enterprise. And so um, I think people have been been more and more interested lately in finding these answers from unstructured text content as people interact with systems like ChatGPT. This idea that search has maybe stopped and ended. And this idea that we can actually get answers is, is pretty compelling. And so um, uniquely here at Kindy, we sell that answer engine to large enterprises. Um, unlike some of the challenges that you see with some of the other large language models, we ensure that our answers are accurate and from trusted enterprise content. Um, our models are explainable to end users, IT and, and management. Um, and it's actually pretty easy to tune and optimize for domain specific content, which we'll probably get into a, a little bit later as, as one of the challenges of some of these large language models. Great, thanks for the overview. Um, and, and Ryan, you are kind of like in AI and like LLM hipster and kind of <laughs> into the space before this like super intense focus um, of recent years. So can you tell us about like, your experience through that journey of like before to now its popularity and kind of how the space has changed while you've been a part of it? Yeah, it was funny. I was I was talking to a VC the other day. Um, so we're, we're raising another round here. Um, and um, they said, uh, what did you do before ChatGPT? 
<laughs> as as if this whole thing started 90 days 90 yeah. days ago. So it's interesting it's, it's it's kind of like saying the, the the start of civilization starts with the birth of christ right um, <laughs> there's pe people b b before that um and so this this space has has evolved uh, a ton what's what's i would say what's most interesting about ai and its its evolution probably you know if we start from like 2012 onwards is there was a lot of focus on image analysis very early on so from like 2012, maybe through like 2015, 2016. And there was a lot of criticism in the AI community about how deep learning models could not be applied to language. And, and language was like this really challenging problem. But then somewhere around 2016, probably 2015, 2016, the entire deep learning community really focused on language. And then we get papers out of Google, like attention is all you need. And then we get transformers and we start scaling them up to large language models. And then we get these GPT models. And next thing you know, you know, we're generating blogs just from a simple prompt. Yeah. And it's just been, been this really incredible transformation and acceleration over, over the last few years. And when you think about it, that that's just been really only a 10 year period. It's pretty, pretty incredible the progress that, that we've made. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from like a computation and AI perspective, um, could you talk a little bit about kind of give us the the elementary school version of what's an LLM? What are we enabling now? And like, why, why couldn't we before and what changed? Yeah, well, well, there, there are some some just fundamental algorithmic and architecture things that that have that have happened and, and that really as i was mentioning earlier with that transformer paper and so if you're interested in kind of getting into the details of this attention is all you need is is kind of like the uh paper to to, to go read to really really understand everything but there's a lot of great great content out there i would say the the from an ai perspective what what has been most fascinating and the thing that's been in your face the most from an end user perspective is the generation of content and so whether it's images or text, it's just fascinating how coherent and readable this stuff is. Um, to think about a few years ago, we were talking about something called abstractive summarization as the state of the art. And so what that would be is, is you know, you're trying to summarize some paragraph and a system would take out a few of the key talking points and add in a little like a few words and you'd have a sentence or two sentences that would be the summarization of that like that was like mind-blowing stuff four years ago <laughs> and now we're putting in a single sentence and an entire blog is being being written and then you're saying oh well can you actually touch on paragraph two and provide a little more detail and it's going into detail like like the the leap that was made is just 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 in incredible and so the thing that from an ai perspective that is most in your face is this is this content generation but there's actually if, if you allow me to just go a little bit further and say the i think the most interesting thing about the large language models is these emergent properties that have that have come up and so that's called this zero shot learning where these systems are doing things that they weren't specifically trained to to do and so historically if i wanted to build a system to do say named entity recognition or summarization or question answering I would actually train a system specifically to do that thing. And that system and that model only did that thing. And so I would not be able to use a system that's trained for named entity recognition for text summarization or question answering. Well, now we have these models that actually do all of them and do all of them really well <laughs> as yeah. if they were trained specifically to do those, to do those things. And, and if you combine that with human creativity, like all of these possibilities that are now coming out of large, large language models and combine that with human creativity, you're now seeing people use these large language models in a ton of, of different ways. And so the most obvious ones are the, the, the text generation stuff that people are doing, whether it's for website copy or marketing content. But then now there, I'm, I'm hearing of companies that are using it for doing data transformation. And so you're using a large language model to take data out of a one data source and put it into another data source with incredibly high accuracy. I would have never thought to use a language model that way. And so it's just really incredible to see that these systems can do multiple things without having been, been trained to do any one of those things, yeah. which is pretty incredible. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating as well, just to hear you kind of talk about um, what you find interesting and, and um, surprising about the development of generative AI. And it kind of makes me think like all of the in your face stuff, as you said, is all the content creation. And, but when it comes down to actual um, adoption and app, like applicability of the technology, um, I'm wondering like all these use cases are springing up very quickly. So um, you know, when it comes from large organization perspective, you know, what has been your experience in trying to get generative, generative AI, you know, actually deployed within large organizations? Yeah, it, it really does depend on, on the use case. And so our experience is, is highly regulated industries with high value use cases. And so in, in that instance, the system has to generate accurate answers from trusted content. It can't be generating or it can't be hallucinating as, yeah. as you see these, these, these systems do. So there's like an extra layer of engineering that needs to go on top of it to ground these models in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, for other use cases like the website copy and, and stuff that are doing in that space, there's a subject matter expert that is, that is in the loop that can review that information and if it's nonsensical, just hit the delete button and hit generate again. And so in actually getting these systems deployed in, in, in the enterprise, it really depends on the use case and that, you're, that you're ultimately looking at. And so like maybe digging a little bit deeper on like my style of, of or our style of, of use case, which is a highly regulated industry where the outputs need to be accurate. You know, you run into all types of, of data privacy challenges, integration challenges, customization challenges, I mean, just just classic stuff with within the enterprise. Um, luckily, there's been an infrastructure that's starting to to be put in place first for just kind of classic machine learning, and now for what people are calling kind of large language model ops, LLM ops. And so that infrastructure is starting to be put in place, and large enterprises are adopting this this infrastructure such that there is commonality um, as you as you go to to deploy, whereas previously. You know, we were just kind of like cutting our way through the bushes, <laughs> trying yeah. to figure out how, how, to, how to deploy these systems. And so any entrepreneur that's starting today, you know, luckily, there's been a lot of, of paths <laughs> that firms like mine, yeah. mine have, have, have cut through the bushes that, that you can ultimately um, follow. And, and um, because there's so much interest in this space, there's a lot of solutions that are, that are being you know, built to help overcome a lot of those challenges. Yeah, yeah. Rising tides lift all ships. <laughs> um, kind of along the same uh, thread, and I think when it goes to towards like adoption and applicability, but also sort of advice for founders and sort of like uh, following the path of of folks like you that have kind of like blazed the trail, like you said. Um, what do you think is going to separate? Um, generative AI use cases and companies that win above sort of all the noise that's now being created, especially as you mentioned in the past the 90 days. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think what's what's super interesting right now is that there you can learn a lot from the first wave of AI companies. And so you can you can think about um, again, I, I go back to, to 2012 as like the AlexNet moment. Um, that really launched this and then really like the acquisition of deep mind really set off VC investors to think like there's money to be, to be made here. And so there's a whole host of startups that were funded by billions of dollars from 2014, 2015 up, up until, you know, uh, probably 2020 when like web three became super hot. <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of those, those companies um, had, had to do things that, that, that weren't the right, approach. And so specifically, a lot of AI companies, and you see this over and over and over, started with the technology and went forward from there. And so they said, hey, I have computer vision. Where can I go apply computer vision at? Mm -hmm. As opposed to starting with the customer and the end user and working back and saying, what is the problem that's trying to be solved here? Or what yeah. is the job that's, that the person needs to do and working back and deciding whether or not you actually need machine learning or you need a neural network or you, you need a large, large language model. And yeah. so I think there are a lot of companies that wasted a, a lot of money um, trying to take this technology and go find a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you can learn from that. And I would encourage all founders in this space to really start with the end user and the problem that you're trying to solve and work back from there and figure out whether or not you actually need this, this large language model. 
or generative AI, and then if you do, is the product that you're building going to be 10 X better than, than what was, what was before it. And so like in our, in our case, um, people spend uh, conservatively about one day a week looking for answers to questions in the enterprise, which is just ludicrous. And so now if you're able to have a, a system that you can ask a question and get an answer back right away, that just is 10 X better than what was before it. And same with like these systems that again, do like marketing copy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas previously you had to have a, a bunch of, of, of people writing this content and now you're just putting in a prompt and two seconds later, you're getting several blog posts I and mean, that's 10 X yeah. better than what it was, what it was before. Um, and so really think about the problem that you're trying to solve and work back to the technology, as opposed to starting with the technology and working forward to some, some problem, you're going to waste a lot of time, money and, and venture capital. I'm going that way. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to ask a question about kind of your, your personal experience and, um, in the space. And you mentioned um, the data transfer being a really interesting application of this technology, but is there any other use case or uh, company that you've seen that really kind of made you think, wow, that's cool, or that's a unique uh, application um, or what, what gets you excited? Yeah, uh, honestly, people are coming up with stuff every day. Uh, the, the data transformation one that I was, I was talking about is uh, a friend of mine is, is work, working on this. It, that, that company is called Number Station, which I think was, is, is super interesting and candidly is something I, I would have never, never thought about. And there's other companies that are doing similar stuff where you can uh, turn questions into to SQL queries and then get a bunch of, of business intelligence out of some, some structured data source. And so it was just just all these these really interesting use cases, but stuff's popping up every day. And it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the emergent properties of these MLMs combined with human creativity. And so if you kind of think about, you know, if you had an instrument that can only do one note, yeah, humans could probably come up with a, a few songs, right? But if you have however many notes there are in, in, in music, you now have infinite songs, it seems like. <laughs> and so these LLMs, can do more than just just one thing, and so um, you know the data transformation one was 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 a fascinating one. The copy editing, um, a lot of people applying this to search, which is just just super fascinating to think that there's a completely different way to interact with computers. Because my whole life, the only the primary way that I've interacted with computers is via the search bar, and the only way that I've been able to do that is a keyword and blue links. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. all of a sudden, you open your your computer and you type in a question, and it gives yeah. you an answer. You know, my wife was was planning a vacation to Croatia and she, you know, typed in what's the itinerary and she got a answer yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, go to these, go to these cities, do this. And she looked at me and said, I'm never using Google again. And that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting, just like non-technical person. I, I mean, I don't know if your wife's background is technical or not, but for me, I'm it's not. not. <laughs> it's yeah. Not. It's like just for normal daily life, interesting applications. I, and I, I was speaking, I was speaking to another, another person the other, the other day at dinner and, uh, and they had to, this is sort of manager uh, at a, at a large tech company. And the person had to, to write an email that probably would have taken them an hour and a half to write. And they wrote it in 10 minutes. Yeah. And, yeah. and this person, you know, does, does not, you know, uh, is doing much higher value things than, than mm -hmm. writing that email. And so now it gets the, an hour and 20 minutes back in their day to go do that high value thing. I mean, there's just stuff popping up all over the place and the way that people use it is just every day I hear something, something completely different and it's just super fascinating and it's moving so quick that I can't even keep up. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I read information, I read stuff all day long on, on this space and every day someone's coming to me and saying, have you heard this? And I go, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, even just yesterday, my brother-in-law was showing me um, a tool called mid journey and I, it, you type oh, yeah. in whatever you want. It just generates an image. That's exactly what, you know, you're aiming for it's crazy. It's wild. Um, so I, I have a, a question for you that we ask all of our presenters and, and guest speakers. Um, since we are a tool for early stage founders, and this is an event for early stage generative AI founders, um, what advice would you give 
these founders today um, that are, you know, building these these tools at the early stage. Yeah, I'll touch I'll touch on uh, two things here. So so the, the one piece of advice I'll just double down on is just start with the, the, the problem first, which is which is absolutely critical of, of any any startup. I, I would say what is what is super interesting about this space for founders now is that the cost of building an AI company has collapsed. And so I, I remember I remember seeing a, a, a slide in a, in a presentation from a VC at, at one point that, that showed like in the 90s, it cost, you know, I'll call it a few, like $10 million to build a software company. And then in the early 2000s, it costs like $100,000 because of the cloud and people can just, you know, write code and deploy applications and it was super easy. The same thing has happened in AI. And so like from 20, if you started an AI company from 2015 to 2020, you were gonna spend probably $20 million building your initial product release. And it like for, for an enterprise platform. On average, peers of mine, uh, I collected this data, it took them $27 million burned, venture capital burned to get to a million ARR. That's compared to historically like a million dollars for, for a SaaS business. And the reason is because we had to hire a bunch of, of AI experts, employ them, very expensive, gather a bunch of data, label a bunch of data, build a model and do all that. Well, that's done <laughs> via API now. Yeah. And so your ability to build an AI company has just collapsed to basically nothing because people are probably subsidizing you to build to build on, on their, their um, foundation model. And so like start with a, start with a, uh, a problem in mind and then leverage all the resources that you have now from all these foundation model companies to quickly iterate on on uh, your your application that you're that you're building, um, and it's really like there's no better time to be a, an AI founder than than right now. Awesome, well, it's very inspiring, I think, for the teams here today um, that are about to pitch uh, to our panel of judges. So um, I do want to be respectful of time, but we have one audience question um, if you're up for it. Oh yeah. Awesome. It's actually a Kindy related question. So this one should be easy for you. Um, they're wondering kind of how Kindy's deployed, um, how users interact with Kindy. Um, and if you could just share a little bit more about, um, you know, the tool itself and how it's used by. Yeah, sure, uh, sure, customers. sure. So, so there's, there's a few, few ways that we can, we can deploy it. So for the, for our, we'll call it B2B to C use cases. Some people like to embed us into the, the website. So we work with our gener large enterprises where customers will visit that site. And there's a lot of content and it's quite literally like the search bar or a chat interface. And so we are the search bar or the chat interface um, or the answer engine behind those two uh, interfaces. And so if people were to deploy us on their site. It's like three lines of code and it's a widget. It's kind of like, like, Google Analytics, it's super, super easy. And your site with all your content can become a answer engine. So people can go there, um, ask questions of the content on your site and get, get an answer back. Um, for enterprises, well, now we're talking about like virtual private clouds <laughs> and, and those kind of like on-prem like, like deployments where the, the data needs to be protected and, and separated from, from all of the other data. And so we have multiple deployment models depending on the, the use case. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan, um, for all the questions and all the thoughtful answers and um, really appreciate your time. And I really enjoyed chatting with you and catching up a bit. So um, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good luck. Awesome. Thanks. And I'm excited to move on to the pitch portion of this evening. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our judges. Um, so we have Kate Seladets, she's a senior associate at One Valley Ventures, um, Juan Scarlett, who is the managing director at One Valley Ventures, and we have Ash Rust, who's a managing partner at Sterling Road. Um, I want to thank all three of you so much for joining us, um, and I'm going to give you a quick moment to just um, jump on camera and introduce yourselves. Um, and Juan, why don't we have you kick us off? Sure. Thanks, Tara. I'm Juan Scarlett. I lead One Valley Ventures, uh, where we work with partners to develop and execute um, venture investment strategies leveraging the One Valley ecosystem. In uh, late 2021, we launched the One Valley Fund, uh, a pre-seed and seed stage fund focusing on investing uh, in standout companies from across the One Valley ecosystem and our partner networks. We primarily invest in companies along two major themes, um, ongoing digital transformation 
uh, and increasing adoption of AI, machine learning, and automation technologies. Uh, we've invested in a dozen companies to date. Uh, and um, yeah, we're always actively looking for new and interesting opportunities. Uh, prior to joining the One Valley team uh, several years ago, um, I, I led the, um, the investing efforts for a, a fund called Nimble Ventures uh, based in San Francisco, uh, where we made direct investments in early stage SaaS, FinTech and healthcare uh, and health tech uh, companies and also made LP investments uh, in emerging uh, venture capital fund managers. Um, that's mostly about me, thanks. Thanks, Happy Juan. to be here. Thanks, Juan. Um, Kate, you wanna uh, go up next? Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. And thank you, founders, for presenting your companies. Uh, my name is Kate. I'm part of the investment team at Von Valley Ventures, where I work closely with Juan, who just introduced himself and the fund. So I uh, work with Juan, evaluating promising investment opportunities for our fund. Um, I'm originally from Ukraine, where I was part of the team that I would say started pioneering the startup and venture ecosystem in the region. That was a great experience. And um, after that, I uh, relocated to the Bay Area where I co-founded an ad tech startup. And lastly, prior to joining the Van Valley Ventures team, I was on, an, on the investment team at 500 startups investing in early stage tech companies across the globe. Um, so that's briefly about me. Really look forward to today's pitches and wish luck to everyone presenting today. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. And our guest judge, Ash, um, you want to close us out? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ash Rust. I'm a pre-seed B2B investor based in San Francisco. I began my career in computer science about 25 years ago uh, with one of the first people, I believe, to do an AI degree. I uh, came to Silicon Valley in 2008. Perfect timing. Reitman Lehman Brothers collapsed and had some fun and difficult failures after that. Got very lucky in 2010 and ended up as one of the first employees at Clout one of the first social media analytics companies. And that one sold it for a couple hundred million dollars in 2013. Then me and some buddies from Oxford started Sendo, which is basically MailChimp for SMS. We sold that one in 2015. And since then I've been on the other side of the table, an entrepreneur in residence at Trinity Ventures, an advisor at Bullpen Capital, and I've been running my own fund, Sterling Road, since 2017. About 60% of our investments are in AI, and we've been doing it long before it was cool uh, back in 2017. And we do boring stuff like um, CPG analysis in data deserts, computer vision for manufacturing, um, chatbots for medical intake. We are interested in the hard problems. Um, so really looking forward to seeing what you guys offer today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ash. And thank you so much to the rest of our judges. Um, you all have a pretty difficult task ahead of you guys today. Um, as I mentioned, we had more applications than we've ever had and more really great applications than we've ever had. It was very difficult to narrow it down to this group that you'll see today. Um, but there can only be one winner. So today we have Jerome, founder of No Code BDD, Gabe, co-founder and VP of sales at Marvel, Alex, co-founder and CEO of Relay2, Guillermo, co-founder and CEO of Ozaru, Jeff, co-founder and CEO of Zeotag, Sat, co-founder and CEO of Maya AI, Ghazal, founder and CEO of Upbrainery, and June, founder and CEO of Hollow. One quick reminder for our audience about what's at stake for these founders tonight. Um, in addition to a $750 preloaded Rex card, our grand prize winner will be taking away uh, $2,500 in non-dilutive cash, um, a free passport membership, and a one-on-one -on -one session with um, our judges. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jerome, founder of No Code BDD, to our virtual stage. Hi, hi. Uh, can you hear me and can you see me? Yep, we can. Excellent. 
Hey, Jerome, uh, founder of No Code BDD. Uh, no Code BDD is a conversational learning platform. So uh, the problem that we are trying to solve, and it's been a problem for software industry, is the software that gets delivered is not what the customer asks for. We have all seen this name. Maybe it's as old as the software delivery itself. And that's the problem we are trying to solve. The reason why the problem exists is uh, when software requirements are given, typically by a product owner, the product owner has an interpretation about the software. They give that in natural language. When the team takes it, they interpret it differently. It doesn't matter however the natural language is written, the team and different members in the team interpret that differently. As a result, they end up delivering a software which is not expected. And as a result, the cost goes up and the quality also suffers. So how are we going to solve the problem? The answer is in the conversational learning platform. So let's take an example. Let's say when the product owner gives a requirement in natural language, we use AI models to ask several questions and basically get them to derive positive and negative scenarios for the requirements. Basically analyze the requirement and come up with different scenarios. The AI model also learns from the scenario. So as the system gets mature, the AI model knows more about the application itself, maybe at one point more than the users who build the software. Then, each of those scenarios are taken and more conversation happens, this time with the team itself. So it'll ask things like, hey, I don't know anything about your website. Can you enter your website? And then it'll ask things like, hey, no, you asked me to, you wanted to search for some products. Can you give me some product list? So all these information are entered into that conversation and the system keeps learning. Once it learns, it can build an automated system which actually checks whether the software works as per the requirement. So it basically builds an automated testing platform which checks whether the requirement which is in the plain language and the software matches. So that's, that's, that's the idea. Right now in 2023, we are building all the basic blocks in order to enable that AI. We have this platform ready. It's not AI enabled yet, but we have all the building blocks. Our roadmap is to build all the AI throughout, you know, from next year onwards. Once we have the building block, which is so crucial for this, then we will use AI models to build that conversation. So that is to, to fill the gap between the natural language and the actual platform, which checks the implemented software. So we have started well. Um, we are reached uh, more than 2,000 monthly recurring revenue with just three clients, and we have also closed a Fortune 500 client. Um, we have been getting good feedback, um, even without that AI enable, even with our no-code uh, platform as we have now. So our target market, we are expecting. Um, the, the the time to be 50 billion and the sum to be about 2.5 billion. Uh, that's that's the target market we are est estimating. Uh, in terms of competition, um, there are several players in the market, but pretty much all of them focus on test automation. And test automation is becoming a past. Uh, teams, software teams are moving towards behavior-driven development and and also you know, uh, moving away from test automation. So what we would like to focus on this conversational aspect. So the system learns about uh, the whole requirement and also make sure that the software that gets delivered, there are no, no gaps between what the requirements are and what the software is. And that's where we are heading towards. We have got, I've got more than 25 years experience. My uh, product manager has got like uh, tremendous experience. He has built similar platform before for large organizations. Uh, I've got like more than 10 years in the domain. So I understand the gap 
I understand the industry well in terms of behavior driven development and where the software team struggles. And that's how the idea actually came. And um, about a couple of years, we have been thinking about it, but ChatGPT really helped us um, to move, move towards more conversational learning platform. And we also have few engineers, um, really good engineers who are helping in building this platform. That's all from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jerome. Uh, if we could bring our judges uh, on camera and Jerome, if you could stop sharing screen. Yeah. Awesome. Um, do any of our judges have questions? I can also just uh, popcorn. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, th thanks so much, Jerome. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, so you mentioned that um, the solution is not quite AI enabled today. Uh, so what is the solution that uh, the customers are using today and how much value are they getting out of it without this sort of conversational AI piece that, that, that seems to be pretty central to the story? Yeah, so the system that the current customers are using is they enter their requirements in natural language and we have built no code modules so they could use those no code modules to build this testing platform, but they have to enter those information. It, there is nothing conversational from NLP to their, from the natural language to their platform. So even with that, they are seeing 10X improvement because it's all no code. So as a result, you know, whatever they are deploying is much faster and with a very less time. Okay, the 10X improvement is mostly on the time side, on the time. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and also also on efficiency. So um, it allows them to have a, a shorter release cadence uh, and, and very expected release cadence. Okay, uh, thank you. Appreciate no worries. It. Ash or Kate, any questions for Jerome? Sure, my question is, <clears throat> excuse me, if, um, if we found these uh, few customers based on the no code platform, are we gonna find our next set of customers for the AI enabled platform the same way? And how, how is that? How do we find those customers? Yeah, so Ash, great question. So, so far we have been finding these customers purely based on no code. Um, so, but still, as I mentioned, they still, they need to enable from the natural language to the testing platform without no code. So in terms of finding the rest of the customers, we are going to bring in this conversational part and the learning part in order to go and find those customers because it's a big gap in the market where the-, uh, the Sorry, just to push. So how did you find your current customers and what's the plan for the new ones? Okay, the current customers we are finding uh, purely via uh, references and organic. Okay. Uh, we haven't paid a single penny yet on advertisements or anything. And the future customers are going to be throughout the same channels. So we are building a very good channels for those. Okay, thanks. No worries. And Kate, we have time for one quick question if you have one. Perfect. Um, just curious how accurate the verification process currently is comparing to other automation test tools and uh, how much of it is currently automated uh, versus um, being done manually? Um, it is pretty accurate compared to any automation tool. So you can compare to any automation tool in the market and, and, and compare it against our tool. And we do cover quite a lot of tech stacks. And uh, with our clients, uh, about 90% of their use cases are automated. 10% they still use manual testing because we don't support some of the you know, obscure, um, obscure scenarios. Got it. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, judges. Um, and thank you, Jerome. And thanks so much for joining. I know um, for those of you that don't know, Jerome is based in the UK, so it's very late for him. Um, and we very much appreciate you um, taking the time to join us. Yes, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, awesome. Next up, we have Alex, co-founder Oh, I'm sorry. Next up is Gabe, <laughs> co-founder and VP of Sales of Marvel. Um, please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage.
Um, Gabe, you're on mute uh, and your camera is off if you could turn both those things on. Sorry about that. Um... All good. It wouldn't be a virtual event without some technical difficulties. There you go. You can see it now. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. My name is Gabe, and I'm here today to talk to you about Marvel. Marvel is a technical co-pilot for sales teams. So just to tell you a little bit about the problem space that we're working in, um, B2B sales, uh, SaaS sales, is it's really tough. And it's only gotten more difficult uh, over the past couple of years, just with the proliferation of all sorts of different companies competing for attention. Now with the advent of generative AI, it's very easy to essentially create a list of personalized emails to be sent out to all, all, all the prospects that you're looking to get in touch with just at the click of the button. Um, so all the sales metrics essentially to measure productivity and efficiency are uh, going down. And so we're asking the question essentially, how can we help sales teams close more deals? And a big problem that exists in the market, especially with high tech companies like cybersecurity companies, is that sales teams are selling very complex products, but they themselves are not technical, but their buyers are. So there's a huge knowledge and experience asymmetry between the buyer and the seller. This creates a uh, environment where it's very easy for the seller to essentially lose credibility and kill rapport with their prospects, decreasing win, win rates and essentially extend, ex, extending sales cycles. And what a lot of companies do to sort of help with the technical side of the sale is hire pre-sales consultants or solutions consultants is sometimes what they're called. Um, and these are essentially just technical people to answer questions and sometimes do demos throughout the sales process. Uh, the problem with doing this is most people who are domain experts are going to actually just work in their field. They don't want to work in sales. And so what ends up happening is companies will simply find a young, bright salesperson and spend, spend months and months training them to become a product expert. But this is essentially a very uh, time-consuming and costly burden on companies. And so this is essentially where Marvel comes in. So Marvel will help coach and train your reps uh, on your product and provide real-time deal summaries and actionable insights to prepare them for deals. And then on the calls, Marvel will respond to any technical request question that comes up during that call and will help your rep navigate the technical aspects of that sales cycle. And at the end of the call, based on the call recording, which almost all sales teams will use call recording software, it'll update the CRM so which will streamline those admin tasks and suggest next steps uh, to qualify deals from a technical fit perspective. And as far as our traction so far, uh, we're focusing on cybersecurity companies. We have two clients in this niche already who are using the software. Uh, it's a niche we want to focus on, A, because most cybersecurity products come with a fair deal of complexity. Uh, there's high standards for data security. So if we uh, sort of conquer this niche, so to speak, it'll be easier to move horizontally into other verticals, and it's a very competitive market. And as far as go, go to market, we're charging $49 a month plus usage, and we have a free version just to get people on board uh, and uh, proof of concept. And then we have an enterprise package that comes with more support as well. As far as the actual market, I mean, the CRM market is obviously huge. Sales enablement market is smaller, but it's growing fast as well. And then, of course, Gen AI is just starting out, and we all expect that to be uh, you know, a very large market moving forward. So we've, I think, conservatively estimated the market to be worth uh, upwards of $3 billion. And as far as our team, we have a great team, very interdisciplinary. My background is in software sales, and um, our co-founder, Narges, She's a second time founder and her background is in data science. And then Pravin, our CTO, his back, he's also has experience in startups and his background is in AI and uh, machine learning. And yeah, that's uh, it for me. Uh, looking forward to hearing your guys' feedback. 
Great, thanks so much. Um, let's bring our judges up. And if anyone has a burning question for Gabe, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I will call someone out. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start again. Uh, Gabe, Gabe, thank you so much uh, for, for presenting. Uh, super interesting. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, it, I guess with the, with the two clients that you've had, you, you've had using the product thus far, how much improvement have they seen uh, in, uh, in, their, in their sales activity, sales closure rates? So we're still testing and trying to identify the metrics that we're moving as within the pipeline. So I think it's too early to say, if I'm being honest. Can I ask how long have they been using using the product? Yeah, so they they've, they're, they've just finished onboarding. So it's only been okay. a couple of weeks. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Understood. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's definitely something as, as an investor, it's something that I, I would be keen on understanding yeah. um, as, as I look at the opportunity further. But, but certainly, I think uh, what, what you're doing is interesting. Yeah, so we have our assumptions about what we think are, is going to move, but we want to sort of test and make sure we're doing the same thing that we're expecting. Uh, curious, uh, what platforms are you currently integrated with? Are you taking some sort of kind of gradually integrated with the larger CRMs that are you typically used by sales teams, or you provide kind of custom integrations based on the customer requests. Yeah. So we're integrated it with uh, HubSpot right now uh, is the only uh, HubSpot and Suite CRM, but we're planning on uh, integrating with Zapier, which has a integration and API with most CRMs out there. And then down the route road as well, we'll integrate into Outlook, Gmail, G Suite, and uh, all the gong and the call recording softwares as well. Yep. Thank you. These two customers that you're onboarding right now, what were they, what were the other software platforms they were considering apart from you? So I don't think, I think it, our conversations, we got them early enough that I don't think they were really shopping around for other software. So we really, I think, got in at a good time, I guess. Awesome. Thank you, judges. And thanks so much, Gabe. Sweet. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have Alex, co-founder and CEO of relay to Please welcome him to our stage. Hi everyone, Alex here, uh, co-founder of relate to We are a no-code platform that helps B2B marketers and sellers magically turn their presentations and PDF into interactive experiences that help them persuade and engage their audience. And we can do that in a few clicks. Um, so um, why, and by the way, you're looking at an interactive presentation right now. There's a URL here, you can check it out that we're going crazy and doing a live product demo. Uh, so, uh, so you could see a little bit of uh, what's behind the scene here. Uh, so what um, the foundation for me personally is that my very first gig working at Microsoft product office team, uh, we received this thing called the PDF that swooped in and took over Word and PowerPoint as the last mile format for connecting with the customers. And um, this is an $11 billion worth problem because today um, these customer facing documents are consumed exactly the same way they were, you know, almost uh, more than two decades ago. And the problem was that it's the virtual piece of paper that really was invented for printing and designed for a world that no longer exists. And naturally later in my career, whether it was Stanford Business School or Salesforce or success factors, as a marketer and seller, I, I wanted to create websites, but it was too expensive and never enough time to get it around and too complicated to communicate sophisticated and complex ideas. And so um, a lot of marketers are spending a ton of money to get to connect to their customers, to get them to a meeting and then underwhelming them with this content. But we believe something fundamentally is shifting now. We're gonna break the back of the PDF because of all the trends that we've been talking about all day today, no code, 
the zero cost of copywriting, overwhelming everybody. But I want to highlight two companies in particular. Canva has transformed graphic design, democratizing. Figma has transformed and democratized product design. And just with the same intent, we are going to democratize interaction design. And how we're going to do that is very deliberate. We're going to take the simplicity of the document. We're not going to completely get rid of the Word and PowerPoints and PDFs. We are going to take it in and mix it with the best of the web. That is what is our approach. It's starting with first principles because to move the enterprise over, you need to be very deliberate. So here's one of our enterprise customers, Salesforce. We're very excited. We've been working with them as a foundational client. We are going to show you in a few clicks what we can do with one of their PDFs. I'm just going to slip into it. This was a static page. You can see it's animated. And then there's a video. That's our AI magic allowing you to fill it in underneath the text. As I continue scrolling through this experience, you see another animation. I could jump to any page. I could have immersive experiences right inside the document without leaving it and play it along. And um, this sits inside a content hub of related assets. So I have a connected experience uh, across the document. And then my favorite feature that the customers are just loving is in the click, we could suggest multiple intelligent viewing experiences for this asset. And you could switch from a presentation into a microsite immediately. And so imagine the cost of building a sophisticated microsite now is as simple as using a PowerPoint template. So that's very quickly and related. We could obviously go on a lot more, but uh, in a nutshell, the product does three things. We're taking any static file, not just PDFs anymore, and making a new web-based medium for engaging for consumers. Then for the authors, we have a no-code SaaS solution that allows you to go from the very beginning of the journey from generation all the way to the analytics in a, in a few minutes and start getting value from your content right away uh, from this engaging experience. And obviously this is enabled by a bunch of new uh, AI capabilities. We've had been experimenting with many for, for actually a few years now. And then the, the some of them you've seen, the, the background videos, the navigation, which is automatically generated here across the top. The one that's most exciting for us is that you could now interrogate your PDF and ask questions with it, of it in a secure and enterprise grade environment. Um, so how we've gone to market, recently we launched the no code solution. We opened it up uh, through G2 to all sorts of users. Uh, we have a, introduced a free tier, which we haven't had before. And um, we got very lucky. We are a leader or a momentum leader in 10 categories which means that every team and every enterprise has the potential to use the platform. And some of them are real surprises. We didn't have a flip book category. This is this weird flipping thing that you do. We are number one in that now because we built an addition because customers wanted it. And teams from corporate comms doing analyst report, annual reports, ESG reports are using that in publicly listed companies. So these are some of our customers. We are, uh, seeing traction with enterprise teams that are paying us a you know, decent amount of money considering we have no sales team, no marketing team. And we've only raised about a million uh, pre-seed. And we're very excited to see the growth momentum that we're seeing expansions uh, from the existing customers with the renewal starting to come in. So um, this is our, there's our growth momentum. I think the reason we've been able to do it is because we have a wonderful team. It's really a team of founders. Nikita, my CTO, uh, ran his own interactive e-learning startup and e-learning was on the cutting edge of making business content more engaging. Uh, we have uh, you know, a bunch of developers and designers who are all entrepreneurs. Uh, and so we're just excited that everybody's stepping up on a small team and we're backed by wonderful investors uh, who led no code and SaaS companies and basically established bottom-up B2B category. We are very excited for you to try out the product. You can find it on uh, related.com. There's a free option for those of you that want to kick the tires around and let we'll let you know when you can try out the, the in, in upcoming um, AI capabilities. So I'll pause here and see if you have any questions at this point. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, we'll turn it over to the judges. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, this looks really interesting. Um, so a few quick questions. Um, 
so this could be um, kind of a new user experience for sort of traditional sales teams. So just wondering how the onboarding process currently looks like and how long does it take? Uh, my favorite story uh, is that we have a customer that signed up to the free version of the product, um, played, got a pretty successful interactive experience in, in, in a few minutes, booked the meeting, uh, next day, they, um, they, after the first meeting, they purchased the product on a team plan and they're, they're, they went life with it. So this is, this is not the, this is the extreme right now. This is not happening all the time, but what we're starting to see, uh, is that we've moved from a high touch. We actually started an app may remember this from Alchemist, which is on our backer. We actually were sitting behind the scenes and creating this content and trying to test out well of the work. And we've moved fully over from tech enabled service to a no code platform where a user could get immediate value. I think sales teams take a little bit more time to onboard obviously because they're not as savvy as a marketer or designer or creator. And so we typically see that a successful deployment will have a savvy power user and that will drive the onboarding. And then there could be their audience that they get distributed the content to and become their channel. So it's sort of a marketing and sales work hand in hand in this context. Got it. And a kind of um, related question, um, out of those three groups that you're focused on um, across your enterprise customers, where do you see the most kind of demand and interest uh, from sales teams, marketing teams, or creators? So what we found is that a successful deployment for us uh, involves a somebody whose creation dedicated on the team so somebody that like so teams that we work have a lot of content it could be a small team but they have a lot of content and so that's sort of one persona and that could be a designer or it could be just a content coordinator uh there is definitely a revenue oriented marketer that's involved so they could be abm marketer they could be running campaigns on demand gen side with ebooks but there's somebody who kind of is able again to crank out content and then the sales um we love sales, especially now, because obviously, um, you know, you instead of hiring an extra salesperson, you can imagine having this interactive experience, interactive product guides. Uh, no SCs need to be hired anymore because we could actually create interactive uh, journeys. So on the, we're seeing that the sales is a great way to monetize. And our best case study is the, our, our flagship enterprise um, kind of cornerstone customer uh, they ran, um, as they were working with them, $4 billion worth of pipeline through relate to in sales pitches. And their win rate was 2X. So I think if we do get to sales where they're, they're supported by content creators and marketers, we are unstoppable. If we go to sales by ourselves, you know, salespeople are not known for creating, you know, the best looking PowerPoints in the first place. So if you give them, uh, you know, a tool that amps that up, that could be, um, you know, too much for, for them without support. Hopefully that answers the question. So we're seeing kind of the, the, the sort of evolution of this. And as we become easier and easier to use, I think that equation is changing, right? Like, so you could get instant value and even if you're a sales rep, but you're not gonna build the world's most interactive experience, uh, you know, if you don't know how to use PowerPoint. Alex, thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Alex. Um, we are running over time. So Juan and Ash, if you have some quick questions, I think we can throw them in, um, but just keep them, keep them short. <laughs> Ashley, do you have anything? If not, I, I can jump in with one real quick. When's the AI gonna launch? Next week. Well, I mean, again, we're launching, we, all of these animator and navigator, they already, they are, we've been testing that. Uh, so, for example, table of contents could be multidimensional in a large continent, but the chat, uh, the content chat, which is the, the feature we're calling is next week. And it's integrated into the rest of the product, so it's not like a standalone AI, so that's sort of what we think is the wedge there. Thanks, Ash. And was that your question as well, Juan? Uh, I, had, I had a separate question, but, um, but we, can, we, can move, we can move on. That's fine. Thank you. Great. Thanks, judges. Thank you, Alex. Alex. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alex. Good to see you, Alex. Yeah. And up next, please join me in welcoming Guillermo, uh, co-founder and CEO of Ozero, to our virtual stage.
Hello, my name is Guillermo and I am the CEO of Osaru. So let me tell you about our story. We began building uh, an AI that will teach data to everyone, how to become a data scientist. So we went with one question, why was data so hard? And after a year, we find out that it's like the holy grail. It has both coding, math, and it make, makes people feel stress. Accenture says that uh, an average business guy at least takes three days of a year procrastinating uh, analysis tasks. So that is tough. So we were building a learning solution that could be 10 times better than any existing LMS because nobody wants to learn something as tough as data on a class. So we invented a new system to train the next generation of data scientists. Our solution was a mixture of rapid learning. We should do on WhatsApp one minute capsules of content three times a day. And in just seven days, we can teach you any new skill as cleaning data or making analysis. And we throw AI to be your coach live so you can train on the spot. So once you learn how to clean data, you can actually make a question live and it makes sense. And in just two months, we were making amazing results. After six months delivering the solution to the market, we were working with Fortune 500 companies such as PepsiCo or Abe InBev. We already have 400K in ARR and we had 600 users. But then, on March 14, everything changed. We learned that now with AI, you can avoid knowing code or math. There are no longer basic constraints for learning data. So pretty much we were teaching stuff that will be replaced by GPT-4. So if we maintain the same course, we were destined to fail because we will never scale as big as we want to or hope so. And then last week on the Gartner event, a genius one presented with one simple promise. We are the GPT of numbers. And with our solution, you don't need any training or data literacy skills to play with us. It was amazing. It was impressive. Each week, 70 new AI startups are created. So pretty much we saw that there's an opportunity to train 1 billion employees because they will need retrain. We saw that this technology, we find out with our own users, it's not that intuitive. It's like going to a restaurant. Once you get in, if the chef tells you, ask me for anything, I can do anything, the user gets overwhelmed. It's just like, don't make me think, give me a menu, please. And now with these promises, management demands that employees are more productive. Who will teach employees how to use and combine the, these AIs? Because every company has its own AI and you don't, there's no one size fits all. Not one single AI does everything. If you want an image, it's one type of AI. If you want the text, it's another. If you want a solution or analysis, it's another. From Bloomberg to Notion, there are simple but not so familiar ways to work with all AI apps. And it gets worse, worse every week. So the main pain for every CEO in the next five years will be reskilling their workforce. Employees will need to train on how to use these AI tools because every software out there will have some sort of AI. And as we find out in data, the same constraints remains. People don't have time for classes and people need to learn this fast on the spot. And the most important thing, non-existing training method out there was built thinking on how to do something based on AI, none but ours. Suddenly, the story was ours. We find out that by teaching people tough things as data, we already have a winning formula. We can create enough training material to teach any skill in one day in, 70 language, in, 70, in seven languages thanks to GPT-3. And we already know that with our teaching method, we can teach something as hard as data seven times better than an LMS. And we already have a human-to-AI interface because we find out that people don't know how to use an AI, you need a menu, you need some help. So let me introduce you to Yuriki 4.0, the first human to AI training interface. It's a 100 billion opportunity. It's really simple. You choose your role. You say you are a UX designer or a sales rep or a business analyst. You see all the tech stacks available and you start building. You can try the same task on different AIs and see the results. Or you can simply just try to teach 
or learn something specifically to a task? Do you want to understand something or evaluate something or plan something? Once you choose what you want to do, you can do a double click and see what's the best result. It can be a diagram, like the next step solution. Not everything is generative. You actually need to learn how to do something new. It's like building a PNL. Maybe a genius can build you the math, but you still need to understand the numbers and ask people which part of the data you require for each specific task. So we're building something that can let you put your mind or your imagination into reality, and you can save it and you can share it because we find out that people need complex tasks, not only simple queries. And the most impressive part, we know that people learn on their cell phones. People read due to COVID, people are reading on the cell phones. They're no longer reading on their laptops. So once you see a recipe that works, you can connect it to your phone through WhatsApp, that it's already 1 billion users. And you pretty much just press any number in a menu and it will give you the specific query that works. So instead of making you think what the best question possible to get a brainstorm, you just choose option five, give me a brainstorm, or you just choose option nine, give me the best next offer. And automatically you just deliver the word that you need a brainstorm and the query is done. And in the meantime, you can also learn because we throw you capsules, small content to complement that learning. So it's like retraining yourself on how to do something with AI. And our flag wheel not only concerns the employee, the employee now can simulate different AIs to see which one works better for what they are imagining. The same question gets different answers depending on the model and the specific query you're using. Da Vinci delivers different things than GPT-3 or GPT-3.5 Turbo. And now all the SaaS AI companies need to train their users and they are only one link of a complex recipe. So it's cost-effective or more cost-effective to them to let us train their users and implement their AI in our simulator so people can try and see if mid-journey is the best way to make their image that they're thinking or they're imagining it. So we have three basic tiers. You can either learn with your team that gives you five uh, licenses with WhatsApp, or you can go pro, that's 25 WhatsApp users, and you can also have a creator tool, which one you can choose your recipes and deliver them through WhatsApp. Or you can go for a creator, if you're another partner and you have other AIs. For example, all the pitchings in this contest are potential customers for us because they need to train their users and it's better to train them on a whole task and not only on the specific portion of the task that they're doing an enhancement. And the team, I myself, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm a specialist in data. Nomara has been on venture capital for the last 10 years. She's been on great schools in Mexican top VCs. And Ernesto is a PhD in robotics that knows a lot about AI. And he's also been on Singularity on the first cohorts. And he knows about entrepreneurship. And our, and our advisors, Paola Fernandez was head of people on Justo, one of Mexican unicorns. And Sean Springs is an NFL player that also owns a company for additive manufacturing and it's really impressive how we can go together to the US. And companies are getting really excited about us. AWS is actually introducing us to clients and Microsoft is introducing us to our sales partners because they want us to teach their users how to use their new technologies enhanced with AI. Thank you so much. Thanks, Guillermo. I'm going to throw it over to our judges. Um, does anyone want to jump in and go first? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, Guillermo, uh, th thank you so much for the pitch. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, one quick question, uh, and then I have, I have another one as well. But um, this this new this new solution that you've come up with over the last month, your Wiki 4.0, is that currently available to, to customers? And, and has anyone actually started to use it? We're testing it in the US with a manufacturing company. They have a software for additive manufacture and we're teaching their users how to use it. And we are our current users, we're offering them to teach more things than data with our current solution. So we're expanding fast with our current uh, client base. When would you expect Yuriki 4.0 to actually you know, start to become generally available to, to both your current users and, and new users? In three months, we want to launch the release, the general release. Right now, it's like in beta stage. It needs a lot of, let's say, look and feel and a lot of user experience enhancement. But in three months, we will hit the market. 
Got it. Okay. Thank you. Do you produce all the content yourself and how does that scale? Right now we can do content really fast we can, because you just take any index and translate it into one line into an infography. And the way we deliver content is way better than any class because with just seven capsules, we can deliver an hour of classes. So we're very scalable. Um, thanks to the AI, that type of tasks can be replicable and translated in almost any language really fast. But yes, we are currently doing the content ourselves because there's no content out there as fast as this. And what's the length of the course? Right now we can teach something as tough as becoming a data translator in four months with just three messages a day. Mm -hmm. And in over a month, you can know critical thinking, for example, like the basics from initial analysis, uh, how to make a powerful question, it's just like nudges, sequential nudges. And all the gamifying experiences and trivias and all that interactive um, part of the content, is, is, is it something you create in-house or you work with kind of third-party um, solutions? That part, we began doing it ourselves, but now we are working with third parties. The, the thing that actually scales is the AI exercise. So this is a huge opportunity for content creators to make contests or trivias or and make this more engaging. And companies already have change management areas that actually lead for this. They, they like the test and the trivia and all that stuff. So we, we help them with our API to do that. They can make push messages to all that, con to, to all that community within WhatsApp in their users. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to our judges and thank you, Guillermo. Um, up next, we have Jeff, co-founder and CEO of Zeotag. Please join me in welcoming him to the virtual stage. Um, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Paul. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Zeotag. When we built Zeotag, and it's built, it works, it's, it's available, people are using it today, is I built it really for myself because there was a lot of long format video out on the internet and meetings and stuff like that, that uh, I didn't have a lot of, enough time to watch all of it. So I wanted to build an AI. Um, Jeff, uh, you're muted, and we lost your presentation. That's right. Well, let's try this again. Yeah. Thank you. How about now? Is that better? Yep. Great. Well, um, so uh, I'm Jeff Paul. I'm the uh, co-founder CEO of Zeotag, and uh, uh, Zeotag is a uh, enterprise B2B SaaS platform that uses our generative AI to make the information contained in videos or audios accessible to everyone in the world, including people with disabilities, people with attention deficit, autism, dyslexia, vision, and hearing, things like that. And um, what it does, it's uh, AI-generated uh, content um, that uses the transcript uh, from any kind of audio and video, and it makes it infinitely searchable and navigable so that all viewers can get to the exact location of the information in the video right away from there. So uh, the problem that we solve is the information that is contained in audio and video is really hard to discover and uh, share and navigate. And it's really hard for those of us that don't have disabilities. If you have a disability, it's a hundred times worse. And uh, if you're blind or you um, have a hearing issue and you really can't get access to online learning, things like that, it's uh, a terrible thing. Um, so you can not advance your career. Um, and uh, for instance, some of the numbers, if you're blind uh, right now, the unemployment rate of adult blind people is uh, near 75% uh, there. So uh, we're helping solve those kind of problems uh, with it. Those are our audiences 
Um, in the US, there's 90 million people with uh, disabilities, learning disabilities, things like that. In the world, it's 1.5 million uh, people um, that are doing it. Um, here is a, a sample Zeotag video. Um, and this is a video running on any platform, could be YouTube, could be Vimeo, could be Brightcove, could be, it doesn't really matter to us where it is. Our AI will create a transcript and then we'll create a table of contents around the around the video from there such that you can search and you can you can get a visual representation of the content that's in uh, the video and you can click around on it so you can search a video you can search entire gallery of videos thousands of videos to find the specific moments in time when your concept is being discussed now this is very different than just searching a transcript uh, around it and our ai creates the thoughts, the ideas, and the summer and the concepts that are being discussed in the video, and we present it in a um, table of for, table of content format. And what we do is we make that information contained in the video very accessible for it. Our uh, key traction is we started selling last year. Uh, we have twelve active clients, uh, roughly four hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue from there. More importantly, we've impacted fifty million learners. So our uh, customers are aggregators, they're uh, educational videos, uh, <clears throat> educational publishers, things like that. And uh, they're using our product to create the table of contents around the videos. And um, you know, that's, that's a big deal for us. Um, and uh, this year, we're projected to uh, uh, get to 150 million people where we're impacting it. So uh, people are buying it. They understand what we're doing. Um, What's interesting is many of today's common products started out as being products specifically designed for people with disabilities. Things like the keyboard. The keyboard was built in the 1850s specifically for blind people. Well, now everybody uses it. Podcasts, audio books, automatic open doors, curb cuts and ramps, closed captioning. All that was specifically done for people with disabilities. And what we found is when um, we solve the problem for people with disabilities, everybody benefits from it. Uh, you know, we use the term, a rising tide lifts all boats. And we believe every video going forward is gonna have a table of contents capability in it. And Zeotag is solving that problem today. Again, our audience is specifically for dis disabled, is people with vision problems, people with hearing problems, people with learning problems. We solve that problem. Matter of fact, we solve the problem for everybody. And this is a presentation we gave to the United States government. The U.S. Access Board looked at our stuff and they said, this is game changing, um, specifically for people with disabilities, but really for everybody from there. Um, we started selling uh, last year and halfway through the year, we sold to North Carolina State University. as a client. And um, two months after we installed, we went back to visit with them. How are things going? And they told me that, Jeff, this is game changing for our students that have disabilities. If uh, they don't have a table of contents, they don't have that around it, it's really awful. And we've never seen a product like Zeotag. So we think, you know, for whatever what, what it's worth, you've really got something here. So I pivoted towards the accessible market uh, because the demand and the response from the customer was so strong. Uh, we went to an educational conference, uh, EduCause in Denver in November, and we were swamped with um, vendors and universities that were interested in us. Um, so right now we're in discussions with a major video platform that they have us piloting at eight of their major universities um, in order in anticipation of an OEM agreement. And the feedback from the clients has been really, really wonderful. Um, the competitive landscape is... Um, um, there's other players that are doing a generative AI, of course, assembly AI, open AI, open AI is there, IBM Watson, Microsoft Azure, things like that. We are specifically done, uh, purposed to go after making online audio and video accessible. And in that market, we're better than anybody. Um, as this assembly AI and open AI continue to improve, we will build upon those things right now. We'll add them to our existing models. 
I have a fabulous team. Um, I've had three exits, two of them to IBM, one of them in the online video space. I did this 15 years ago um, when without the AI, it was manually building table of contents around video, and we sold that. Graham is our CTO, fabulous. Uh, he has an exit, knows um, the uh, computational linguistics business like um, no, nobody else I know. He's, he's really, there's about three or four people in the world who can build this product. I'm so glad that Graham's working for us. Teresa is my cohort. We've been together for 20 years at a couple of different companies, uh, again, three different startups, and she runs our product. And Ellen is our sales executive who uh, comes from the um, voice apps space. Most recently, she was at uh, rev.com. She's had two exits. I have a great uh, strategic advisory board. Uh, we're doing a seed round right now of three and a half million dollars uh, to build out the rest of the company. Uh, to create new relationships with other vendors uh, around there. Our financials are, uh, we'll do just under a million dollars this year. Uh, we have a hybrid revenue model. We, uh, you pay for the platform and you also, um, and that's a uh, ARR. And then you pay for a number of hours that are processed uh, from there. Um, <clears throat> some uh, of our users are Professor Goldstein from uh, Georgetown says, I've been using this for a year. It's really, really wonderful. And our, one of our angel investors is Esther Dyson. Not sure if you know Esther, but she's a prolific early stage investor uh, here out of New York. And she's really been wonderful. She says, Zeotag does for video and audio what Google Maps does for navigation. It lets you see the forest and the trees. And with that, I will uh, take whatever questions you might have. Thanks so much, Jeff. Sure. Um, I'm going to throw it over to our judges. Well, quick, thank you for, for the great overview. Um, sure. Quick question on the go-to-market go side. So you said yeah. one of your main target um, customers are people with disabilities. Um, so you mentioned your uh, targeted universities and yep. through those uh, universities, uh, people mm -hmm. with disabilities have access. Are there any other channels? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so um you know, we say people with disabilities, but it's really everybody. We go to the learning technology people at the thing and they say, this is really wonderful. This is everybody's going to want to have the table of contents. So uh, what's unique about us is nobody is addressing the uh, dis disability market. We're the only ones going that can really um, play in that space. But once you get a Zeotag video, you're never going back. You know, you, you always want to have that search that uh, discovery uh, and that sharing capabilities um, with the Zeotag video. So it's a little unique in that uh, sense, but uh, what we found is um, <clears throat> for corporate learning, um, for events, events like this, you know, you'd say, geez, there was a guy, you know, talked about a guy from Mexico. What was he about? You know, you, you would just search on it and you say, tell me about uh, Guillermo, things like that. And we would, you could have a gallery of, 2000 videos and you could search the entire gallery to find the moment in time in the video when your concept was being discussed as opposed to just a word thing. So our partners are transcription companies and video platform companies. And we're gonna do a partner model where um, they sell our product as an upsell to their existing customers and for the new customers as well. Can this also be available for um, individual users? Yes, it is. Well, yes, we're not uh, today. I'm not structured to do individual sales. We're B2B enterprise software sales right now. As we build it out, you know, we'll certainly make that available. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Kate. And uh, we're over time. So, one or Ash, if either of you have one quick question, I think we can get it in. What do you have any metrics on how much more engaging your video is or a video with your? facilities is? Well, uh, it's what our customers uh, tell us. Um, so th they tell us it's three times more engaging uh, than a normal one. And if, you, if you're just searching just a transcript, it's really primitive uh, behind it. But uh, I don't have, other than those specific numbers, we have customers say, this is life-changing, especially if you're disabled. And even if you're not disabled, you know, the CIO of Boston University said, every one of my, every one of my students needs this. 
You know, I can't give it just to the people who are in a disability group. I have to give it to everybody. Thanks so much, judges. Thanks. And thank you, Jeff. Sure. Up next, we have Saad, uh, co-founder and CEO of Maya AI. Please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you guys hear and see me? Perfect. Yep. There it is. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sat Ramfall, CEO and co-founder of Maya AI, where we are assembling neuromorphic AI systems to accelerate the decision-making process in the enterprise on the progress towards our big mission to achieve uh, theory of mind AI. The big problem that we're solving is that there's approximately three new pathogens each year. And so to be able to to solve those new diseases that come in about, uh, uh, new 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 dis drug discoveries need to be put into place, new treatments, new drugs to, to solve those diseases. Today, around 30% of medical data and clinical data gets misinterpreted by researchers and scientists while they're in the labs trying to solve for this specific disease. And so that means creating new drugs and treatments are inaccurate, long, and an expensive process, almost $1.5 billion and 10 years to take to market. Well, our solution is Maya. And Maya is a 24-7 AI data partner for analyzing, translating, and evaluating in real time of raw unstructured data. So we help pharmaceutical companies repurpose existing drugs and materials into new use cases. We could take any type of data, raw unstructured data, video, audio, text, image, mRNA data, DNA data, protein data, genomic data. And what we do is we're able to pre-train Maya on that in real time via voice or via text. And then she's able to spit out a full generative report on what the, the drug could be repurposed to for the specific disease, what elements need to be included, decluded, and what does success look like for our patient group. And so how do we really do that? Well, we have a, patent, a patented technology that what we call memories for machines. This is our AI engine is a self-learning and self-omitting in engine using various amounts of models like federated learning and swarm learning, more importantly. And what we're able to do with that is sit directly on top of an EHR system via no code, easy integration, but then more importantly, train from real changing data in the world, like research papers, uh, you know, user data, patient data, doctor data, things like that. We're able to train from that as well as in, in real time while we're looking at clinical data. So our data is actually more accurate in, in real time than, you know, a regular system like Helix or PatSnap that is trained on data that's, you know, two years prior or not even considering new research data coming out of medical institutions, universities, and other professionals. We just signed deals with T-Mobiles or T-Systems out in Singapore, the National Cancer Center in Singapore as well, and the third largest tobacco company in the world known as JTI in their clinical labs. Uh, we also have a really interesting traction over, since over the past, what, 60 to 70 days. We have currently three paid pilots in the line. Uh, we've had over 30 demos booked in the past 60 days from enterprise uh, pharma companies. And we've established our partnerships within the Intel Disruptor Program. Uh, we just uh, uh, completed our partnership with NVIDIA, as well as we're in the Microsoft for Startups Program uh, as well. Our market is a $5 billion market going after enterprise pharma. Uh, of 5, 000, uh, there's about 5,000 of them located in, in the world at the size that we're targeting with data teams, researchers, and scientists less, less than 20. We, we like to call our team uh, the Avengers, if you will. Uh, the co-founding team is three brothers. You know, I'm the middle child, so one older, one younger. Uh, we've worked in startups for the past two, uh, seven years in two different companies uh, together. And we have an amazing team. Our CTO comes from C uh, IBM Watson, engineering level three. Uh, we have a PhD uh, chief scientist. He's, he came from Cornell um, Medical and AI researcher. And more interestingly enough, one of our, you know, workers or engineers is actually Maya herself, which is actually coding internally. Um, that's not something that, that we sell, if, if you will. Um, so we've been able to save overhead on salary by employing Maya for a few tasks internally. How do we sit inside of the you know competitive market, uh, competitive landscape? Well, you know, there's companies like PatSnap, InstaDeep, Seek, or Helix that are very, very close to us in, in what we do. However, the market for doing uh, 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 drug repurposing is 
way less saturated than it is for drug discovery. And so most companies in the world are actually doing new drug discovery. We found a lot of value in doing drug repurposing, which reduces the cost by what uh, 70% and reduces the R&D timeline by more than 70% as well. The big thing that pharma companies care about is time to market. Uh, so how do we sit against some of these other competitors that are in the same space as us? Well, we're able to take in unstructured data in real time where most of them can't. One of the big, big things that are really sets ourselves aside apart from the, all the other AIs, and we get asked the question a lot all the time, what makes you different than ChatGPT? Because you could talk to Maya and text Maya. That's kind of how you have the experience of utilizing Maya. Well, each Maya is on its own separate instance, its own dedicated hardware server environment. So the data is never, ever shared at all. And we're also training in real time with self-learning and self-omitting capabilities from our from our technology that we patented. So that also means that we've removed biases from the engine. We've removed humans needing to go in and train the model, pre-train the model, and even quality assure the model as, as it continues to go on. The, and the, the, models have, uh, the models are able to do it uh, themselves. So what are some key takeaways of, of what we're doing in our company? Well, Maya is a robotic brain that uses generative AI to answer data questions and comparatives to the real world, helping scientists inside of the labs uh, look at unstructured data, structured data, data coming in from all over the place, whether it be from the whiteboard or whether it be from the, from the university or from their own clinical and patient data or the hospital that, that, we're, that they're working with. The big goal that we're trying to achieve by working with these companies and you know what are we trying to solve for them is we're trying to speed up the R&D timeline and reduce human error while achieving that. Because there's a, there's about 30% of human error while discovery is going on, while clinical trials is going on, and while go-to-market is, is happening with, with all of that data. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, over to our judges. I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Ash. So I think the idea of using um, private data sets on top of LLMs is, is I guess, this week's hot thing. And um, so I'm curious how you're going to con guarantee continuous improvement if you're isolating the data interactions client to client and not federating that centrally. So when Maya is... Let me back up a little bit. So when we started building the architecture of Maya, we didn't essentially train Maya on data sets per se, on like a drug or, or to do this or to do that. We trained her very generally on subjects. So when Maya is pretty much hired or, or bought licensed, she's out of the box intelligence. And that intelligence continues in the domain that she's hired for. So if she's hired for repurposing drugs in oncology, she'll become a domain expert in oncology specifically as time goes along. So there's a general out of the box intelligence, like a high school level intelligence. And then after like a week, after a month, she becomes a PhD level expert inside of that domain of oncology, repurposing drug for ovarian cancer uh, more specifically. And so that's how it continues to learn because that's self-learning and self-omitting technology that we have. So self-learning from the private data set. So it's always improving based on the real data, changing data from, from the world. And we have cross correlations of that that scores it based on benchmarks. And we have a lot of efforts on what we call ground truths in our models and algorithms. So that way we're removing garbage. We're not storing garbage. We're not putting garbage into the model to, to push out. But you're willing to sacrifice the high quality and unique insights that will come from your client interactions with your bot and not federate them. Well, well, we are considering them through RLHF. So the learning's coming from the actual user. We are considering them. So. Part of that engine is that we have patented is the perspective AI. So the perspective AI is the actual perspective of the user using the product. All right. I have more questions on this, but I don't want to dominate the discussion. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll jump in. Saad, so, so thanks so much for the, uh, for the pitch. Um, super interesting. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, you mentioned that you have three paid pilots uh, going, or, or going ongoing right now. What is it? What, what would a typical pilot look like um, for your potential customers here? How long would it be? Um, you know, I guess you know, what would you expect to to help your, your 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 potential customers achieve during that pilot that would then lead to you know a full a full implementation? Right. Uh, so, so a pilot before like four months ago was like a six month pilot, but we've been able to with the value of our three customers that we have and seeing how fast it was for them to see the value, we've reduced our POC. 
to 30, 30 to 45 days. And they've been able to see value in two weeks or, or, or less. So what a pilot looks like is, you know, when we go on the call, we obviously have a discovery call, you know, the demo, the pilot negotiation. So use cases develop. What happens is they give us their data. We pre-train it in about two days. And then we deliver that Maya towards the user. There's no, in a, there's, there is, for the pilot, there's no integration. So they could use it right out of the box. And again, Maya is something that you talk to, or you can text like a chat GPT experience. So the training behind that is almost slim to none. Because you can essentially train Maya by talking to her or command her by talking to her. Got it. Uh, and okay. then just, yeah, that does help. Thank you. And then just on the business model front, how do you expect to generate revenue? Is this going to be you know, sort of a, a license agreement with, with the companies based on the, the, the new drugs or, or reformation of the drugs that, that you end up developing with Maya or, or some other, or is it the traditional subscription SaaS model? Uh, I would say a more traditional subscription. We're testing out, you know, what a rev share could look like if we just repurpose an existing drug, but there could be existing patents behind that. So we're, we're figuring out those legalities right now. But more traditionally, it's just an annual license uh, for 150000 a year. Thank you. Kate, we are running up on time, but if you have just a very quick question, um, then we can. That's okay. We can move on. Okay, I'll start with you for the next company. Um, awesome. So we've got, uh, thanks, Slack. Thanks so much. Um, we've got two more companies left. Um, up next, we have Ghazal, um, founder and CEO of Upbrainery. Hi everyone, my name is Gazal Kareshi and I am the founder and CEO of Uplandry. Um, Gazal, uh, we are not seeing your screen and we're not seeing your camera. Oh, oh. I'm clicking on start. Oh, here we go. Can you see me now? Can see you. I'm still not seeing your screen though. Oh, okay. And I says it's sharing. I no longer. Oh. Okay. Are you able to see it now? There we go. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gazal Qureshi, and I am the CEO and founder of Upgrain Green Technologies. As we all know that there is a huge mark problem that we're facing, and that is a labor shortage, which is getting worse and will last for decades. And that problem is something that really starts not when you're an adult, but really when we are training and teaching kids in K-12. We should all be exposing and training uh, students to select the right path for their careers in light of this evolving job market. Upper solution really helps students in elementary, middle, and high schools explore careers assess career paths, and eventually learn skills through AI that helps them build a, uh, a very successful skills portfolio. We started this school because there's a huge need, as there is actually allocated funding from the federal government, and it is a market that I know very well from my previous educational company. And as we go along, we will move into other areas such as government training, direct to the consumer as parents, and corporate training and upskilling. The problem that we're seeing is that there's a huge and very specific need in the space of career readiness and skills training, or what we call CTE, placed on school districts by the federal government. And what we have found out through our research and conversations with school is, is that they have is quite a few pain points. 
And one of the biggest pain points that they have is that they do not have the right type of curriculum to teach these. And they specifically have a teacher shortage, which is exasperated to find the subject matter experts in career and technical education. So the market that we are trying to reach is in phase one is the educational teaching skills development market directly for middle and high school students through implementation in the school district. Annually, $1.5 billion are already allocated for CTE by the federal government, which so far has been untapped by any large educational institution or company. And it leaves the market wide open for a company like ours that intersects technology with content is to really take over the space and provide this service. And uh, again, this amount of $1.5 billion is already allocated for the next 10 years. In phase two, we plan to focus on using the same technology and the same content and providing it to our consumers. And then in phase three, we are moving into global expansion and corporate upskilling. So how do we do this? We solve this problem through awareness, exploration, and skill building. Younger students are made aware of careers which are available. They then move through the older grades, and our AI helps them align what interests that they have with the skills that would be needed for, for things that actually interest them and enhances their view of careers and showcases how the acquisition of these skills will help them expand their potential opportunities. We know that this problem requires a multi-pronged approach in order to be effective. So we have created our pro, uh, platform to really create content on the fly. We also use immersive content. We use real world connections through digital internships, gamification, badging and skilling, and together we saw we provide a very immersive, um, engaging uh, platform for the TikTok generation. So we know that we cannot teach this generation in the same old way. They're used to small bite-sized chunks of information. However, that information usually that they found on, find online is not directed towards certain skills development and is not layered. Our technology takes the personalization. It allows a students to be able to understand the skills that they would need. It uses AI to help develop individualized mini lessons to reinforce concepts that students are already struggling with. But the beauty of all this is that our system can actually understand before a student may even understand that they're struggling with a concept and will intercept and provide a personalized experience for that one student in helping to build a mini lesson on the fly. The student's behaviors and interactions with the system actually generates these mini lessons and helps reinforce these concepts. So we know that the content for any learner, not just the students in K-12, but even the adult learner, has to be in small bite-sized chunks. It has to touch on different modalities. It has to provide immersiveness, exciting content, and therefore our content is actually developed to take care of all of that. We've just been awarded um, uh, a, a use case with the City of Houston and the Spaceport of Houston, where they're actually struggling to find enough workers to um, carry on the mission and the, um, and the uh, program that the space port is putting together for exploration and habitation in space. We're experiencing also great success with schools. We have a large pipeline. In addition to that, we've just been awarded a $5 million military contra a contract, which will be a million dollars per year for the next five years. Our go-to market strategy is very simple. We are um, setting ourselves up as the educational experts by establishing authority through uh, different conferences, creating buzz around us, and building a amazing uh, sales team that, that has already has a good book of business. We have a team um, of um, many great educators, business um, folks, 
I myself have had an exit in 2019 with an educational franchise company. We have um, the first female toxicologist from NASA on our uh, as our chief scientific advisor, and our CTO is well versed in the AI. And that, everyone, is Upbrainry Technologies, and we hope you come on a ride with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, over to our judges. Who wants to kick us off? Perfect. I can start. Um, so is the product currently live? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that, Kate? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was asking uh, about the status of the product. Is it currently live? Uh, the product is currently live. The AI tutor is actually has, uh, we have completed the POC and is being implemented prior to our uh, implementation with some of the school districts this summer. Okay, so the idea is to have it as part of a curriculum for the educational institutions. Yeah, so our, cur our curriculum uh, combined with this new uh, AI generated curriculum will be the enhancement that students will need. And one thing I did not mention because of time earlier is that our tutor takes on the personas based on what the subject is being taught, what is the grade level being taught, and how the student um, actually uh, relates to a certain type of personality. Got it, thank you. Ash or Russ, do either of you have a question? So it sounded like you found that one customer was the spaceport uh, building project. How did you find them and where do you plan to find other uh, customers? So um, Spaceport is actually a initiative through the city of Houston. So our uh, main customer that we have is uh, actually the Department of Defense Education Agency, which runs 52 schools across multiple uh, RV bases. That's our main customer. The Spaceport initiative is actually a, com a, you know, it's a partnership between higher ed institutions, us, and then some K-12 institutions, as well as the city of Houston in order to test this this pathway out from kindergarten through 12. And the if answer your question about how do we find customers, we're actually plugged into the ecosystem of conferences, school district uh, sales, um, presenting at conferences. I was actually just today named as uh, Inc. Magazine's 200 female founders. So we're using kind of that to catapult the company as well and going on some speaking tours and things like that. And customers are starting to come to us now. So one school district's talking to the other and things like that. Thanks. Um, Juan, do you have a question to close us out? Yeah, real quick. Uh, Gazel, uh, th thank you so much and, and congrats on the, uh, the designation from Inc. Magazine. Um, just, I just want to make sure I understand how you're actually integrating with uh, and coordinating with the, the existing school curriculum and, 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 and really understanding the academic progress of the students. How, how, how do you expect the solution to do that? Uh, so uh, every state and every, you know even the federal government, everybody has standards. So depending on where you are, your state is going to be actually working with any educational content that is being delivered in the school with a set of standards. Those standards are very open-ended, but they do tell you that in CTE or career technical readiness in grade five, you should be learning X, Y, and Z and in this subject and whatnot. Very open-ended, how you implement it is completely up to you. We have taken on that, that bulk of that work for the last year and a half and really translated that out really, really well. So we are aligned to all the different standards. And all schools have to do is rip the box open figuratively and plug it in. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, judges. And thank you, Gazal. Uh, we are up to our final founder. So um, last but certainly certainly not least, um, please join me in welcoming June, um, founder and CEO of Hollow, to our virtually, virtual stage. Hello everyone, my name is June and I'm the founder and CEO of Holo. We're an AI powered language learning platform for speaking. You press a button and start having a conversation with an AI teacher in three seconds. As an immigrant, I understand the challenges of learning a new language. 
the biggest one for me was actually finding opportunities to speak. Language learners spend most of their time in their textbooks and not speaking, but the best way to learn a new language is by actually speaking, practicing, and immersing yourself in the culture 24-7. Today, people have to live in a different country or book a lesson with a native speaker online for them to practice and speak. But that's pretty expensive and time-consuming. So that's why we created Hollow. On our platform, you can literally have conversations and practice with an AI teacher powered by the most advanced language models anytime, anywhere. And it's via audio and video, not text. You can literally talk about any topic um, based on your level. And what's more is after each conversation, you get feedback real time based on your fluency, grammar, and vocab. You also get a script after each conversation so you can go back and rewatch any mistakes you have made. Currently, we have hundreds of thousands of monthly active students. We have been able to grow organically, and our students are spending 150 million minutes per year practicing and speaking on our platform. We are currently default alive and only one month away from being able to hit that big milestone, profitability as a startup. We have one simple subscription model. You literally pay $30 per month and unlock some of our premium features, including unlimited speaking practice time with AI, unlimited, unlimited AI feedback, no advertisements, and you're able to practice any language on our platform. It's very affordable compared to $20 to $30 per hour you have to pay for you to be able to practice and speak with a native speaker on a different platform. The language learning market is huge and it's growing by $30 billion over the next five years. We just launched 30 new languages recently and we're super excited to really disrupt the whole language learning market. At age 12, I was a semi-pro gamer for StarCraft. Uh, I was a Deloitte consultant with Uber, Amazon, and LinkedIn in the Bay Area. Andrew got into BYU at, eight, at 14, graduated in computer science with a 4.0 GPA at 18, and he speaks 10 languages. So we're very passionate about language learning and solving this huge problem of being able to find opportunities to speak as a language learner. And we are excited to build the best language learning platform where people can actually speak and practice and immerse themselves in the culture 24 seven. I am the story of the customers we're helping. Uh, if I didn't speak English, I would not be here being able to present to you guys and have a conversation. So our mission is to help all language learners throughout the world actually become fluent and dream big. And this is just the beginning of Hollow. Thanks for listening. And I would love to answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I'm going to throw it over to our judges and we're actually going to kick it off with Ash this round. Thanks a lot. Um, so I saw you had 200,000 monthly active users. That's awesome. How many are daily active? So we have about 25,000 daily active users on our platform. And do you have any numbers on how much better you are than Duolingo? Uh, so as far as the ratio, we're actually fairly good. Um, you can also take a look at the ratio between their MAUs and paying customers as well. Uh, so we're super excited to yeah, really become a, a compatible platform with Duolingo where, hey, you go to Duolingo to learn the basics, right? You learn vocab, grammar. And if you want to be fluent and speak, you come to our platform. So that's kind of how we're going to be able to work with Duolingo at this stage. But we're actually working on some level systems where we're going to be able to cover beginners, where people can learn a new language on our platform as well while practicing and speaking. And uh, how do you build the curriculum? Is it you, you mentioned one option is to have it more for like practicing pronunciation and conversations, but also is there like kind of a structured curriculum that will be also available? Yeah, so as of right now, we only have conversations. So you're 
choosing your own topic and having a conversation with, with AI. Uh, we're currently working on content and gamification where we're going to have different levels where you can also choose your own topic. So for example, work, school, um, all these different topics you can talk about at a particular level. So we're still just getting started with this AI platform. Um, and then we're excited to work on content, gamification, leaderboards for us to really increase the uh, MAUs and DAUs and convert them better to our paying customers. And what's the average user retention? Uh, as far as retention goes, we only focus on day one, day seven, and day 30. Um, so day one, we're at about 40%. Day seven, we're at about 20%. And then day 30, we're at about 10%. Got it. And last quick question. How long does it take to implement one uh, language? Uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. We already have all the technologies that we need. Um, so we just need to include additional languages through our technologies, but we really want to focus on the 32 top languages we have and provide the best learning experience. And if there are any needs, we'd like to potentially introduce additional languages. Uh, for example, we're doing this pilot program with a huge language training center here in Utah, and they cover 60, about 61 languages. So we're discussing and seeing if we can provide additional languages for them as well. All right, thank you. Um, real quick, June, uh, well, one, thank you so much for the, for the pitch. Um, just real quick, so 200,000 uh, monthly active users, you know, what's been the sort of, you know, the dominant uh, customer acquisition channel for you uh, and how do you think that changes over time as you scale? Yeah, so it's been mainly through the Google Play Store and the App Store. So we actually focused on the freemium model. That's why we are growing organically very quickly. And we just turned on our subscription model about four months ago. So we're still fairly new with this business model, but it's been growing fairly quickly. Uh, we've already 5x over the you know past four months. So really excited to improve that uh, conversion rate. But as far as our future acquisitions go, um, we are actually nominated by Google this month in April. So we're going to be featured by Google and hopefully we can get featured by Apple as well. So through that sort of, you know, event and nomination would like to be uh, able to continue to grow. Uh, and then just because, you know, we because we just launched 30 additional languages, uh, I think we're going to be able to start working with language learners here in the United States and also in Europe. Um, so that's why we're super excited to really start expanding and growing. Uh, also, as far as our premium services, uh, we're, as I mentioned, working with some organizations for a pilot program. Uh, I think we can even work with the US Army, linguists, school districts, language training centers around the world for us to be able to really help them find opportunities to speak and help them actually become fluent. Thank you. Thank you so much, judges, and thanks, Jim. And with that, uh, we have heard from each of our founders. So now our judges um, are going to tally up their scores. Um, thank you to our founders again so much for joining us today. Um, I'm sure that I speak for everyone at One Valley and every, everyone joining the live stream. Um, we're all very impressed and look forward to seeing what the future holds for all of you. So we're going to take a couple minutes to tally up those scores, um, and we'll be right back.
All right, we have our winners. Um, thank you guys so much for your patience and waiting while we tallied up those scores. I know you're all waiting with bated breath, so I won't hold out on you any longer. Um, the three companies that will be walking away today with a $500 award from Brex are Ziotag, Maya Health, or Maya AI, excuse me, and Hollow. Um, so congratulations to all three of you. Um, we'll be following up after the event um, with some details on how to claim your Brex prize. And our grand prize winner, who will be walking away with a seven. Uh, $150 Brex card as well as a $2,500 cash prize and a free passport membership is, drum roll, Relay2. So congratulations to the entire Relay2 team. Um, thank you to all of our companies for coming out and pitching. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, and I just want to give one last thank you to our judges, um, Kate, Juan, and Ash, and also to our guest speaker, Ryan. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our, our great audience um, for joining us today and to remind you to use the code PASSPORT30 for 30% 30 off of your premium passport membership. And on behalf of the entire team at One Valley, I want to thank all of you so much for joining. Um, thank you again to our founders, and we're excited and can't wait to have you back soon.